Okay, so I'm Nick Doran. I'm going to be talking today about fighting gerrymandering in 2020. And we're going to start talking about it today, even though it's the year 2017. Uh, I have a bunch of different jobs, but in the um, when I was attending the conference, uh, I was acting sort of just a private citizen, not as my employer, and I'm not like officially speaking for the conference today, but it's more like a report on what we saw there, what we're working on, and trying to spread the word about this particular group. So a little bit more about me. Uh, in 2012, I joined a little group called Code for America, did like a fellowship with them. Uh, after that, I worked with the city of Boston GIS, uh, Data Made, and Civis Analytics here in Chicago. And uh, about a year ago, I was here talking about a project that we did in Myanmar about their election. And while I was working on that, little did I know, uh, another democracy, a little bit closer to home, was also in peril. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about this new, very new group called MGGG, Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group. I, I, always, I personally forget the name often, so I usually Google Tufts Gerrymandering because uh, Tufts University was helping to organize, and there's some articles about it if you Google. And all the videos that happened at this conference, including real experts in each one of the topics that I'll talk about today, uh, the videos are on YouTube. So if you want to view that, that's cool. Uh, if you feel like, oh no, I missed this event, uh, there's going to be a similar one uh, in October, very close to here at U University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, registration is open, so put on a coat, go up to Wisconsin, uh, take this event. Um, I'll, if you're not interested in gerrymandering yet and you're curious about it, hopefully by the end of the talk you'll be interested in going to this. So what are we even talking about right now? So gerrymandering is this problem that involves three, the three different branches of government, right? Uh, and Pennsylvania I use as a good example of this because it's as close as you can get to one half Republican, one half Democrat. And in 2016, people voted for members of Congress, and a slight majority voted for a Republican member, and a slight minority voted for a Democratic member. But the number of seats that went to Republicans was 13, and the number of seats that went to Democrats was five. Uh, and so this is the map that resulted from that. And this isn't really like illegal or unconstitutional anyway, because the U.S. is not proportional. It's not like 60%, 40%, and then we choose the representatives then. So it's not dis designed to be proportional. But why is the difference so big from 50-50 to 13-5? to And it's des deliberately drawn that way. Representatives, when they're in power, especially when one party has all the houses and the, both houses and the governor's office, uh, they'll be able to control the redistricting process and sort of come up with a compromise that benefits one party over the other. And this isn't necessarily, there's not, there, as far as I know, there's no political party that said they're against gerrymandering in their own favor. Uh, this is something that's definitely happened. It's just current, in our current moment of time, it's sort of fallen in with other like late early voting and automatic registration, other parts of the electoral process that strengthen our democracy, but end up getting politicized. Um, so probably, if you haven't looked this up before, you're saying gerrymandering, where does that even come from? What a strange word for it. So it comes from 1812, like very early on in American democracy. This guy, whose last name was Gary, uh, drew his district to benefit himself. Uh, not really a political decision, but more something of, well, these people need to be in my district, and these people are they don't like me, so I'm going to keep them out of my district. And a newspaper drew this uh, editorial cartoon making fun of it and calling it a salamander or a gerrymander. So that's how uh, U.S. government works. Um, and where do gerrymanders come from? Like, how do, how do these get created nowadays? So every 10 years, uh, you participate in the census. Uh, if you go to one of these conferences, you'll hear a lot of conversations about how they find people for the census and how they count people for the census. And, you know, if you're born at this part of 2020, do you count or not? Uh, 
but they do that constitutionally. We count everybody every 10 years, and we use that to decide how many representatives each state will get. And then it's sort of a free-for-all for the state what they want to do with those representatives. There is no federal U.S. Constitution rule about how districts should work. So each state has their own rules. For Alaska, uh, there's just one district, okay, so they don't need to do redistricting. Uh, but other states, such as Illinois, uh, on this map you can see that the legislature uh, is deciding that. Is it real? Um, other states, it just depends on what the kind of system is. Uh, and then in uh, Hawaii, in California, in other states, there's some independent commissions and things like that where they'll organize it that way. And this is just for the Congress districts. Then there are other rules involving for the state legislature, how do they decide where to put their representatives. So there's a whole, like many, multiple levels of rules behind this. And naturally, when people's election depends on uh, where they draw the lines, and they're responsible for drawing those lines, there's sort of these factors that get involved and people choose where the lines go. Now, this actually, even though it has been around for a while for people to protect themselves in their office, it actually isn't like consistent across U.S. history how it worked. Um, in the early 1900s, uh, there was no like requirement that they actually had to go through the process of redistricting. They would do the census. The state would have the same number of uh, congressional districts, and they would decide from then to um, just keep the districts in the same place. So even though cities were rapidly growing, rural districts were getting to be smaller populations, uh, no districts were being redrawn because it benefits the people who are currently in office. In 1942, it went to the Supreme Court, and uh, several justices, including uh, Felix Frankfurter, who wrote the opinion, that's a per Supreme Court justice's name and not a cat name, uh, said we don't, it's, the Supreme Court really did not want to change how districts work. They didn't want to get involved in another branch of government because then it would cause several problems for them and interference in different parts of politics. But 20 years later, uh, a separate court case, Baker v. Carr, uh, said, you know what, there are nine times as many people in this urban district as there is in a rural district. That's not fair under the 14th Amendment it has to be unconstitutional from now on. So the 1960s were a huge change from the old way of gerrymandering and redistricting to a new system where they were now expected to redraw all the state's lines every 10 years. And then, as we know from other parts of history, in 1964, there's a Civil Rights Act. In 1965, there's the Voting Rights Act. This changed the number of people who can vote, uh, access to voting, how people are represented, uh, just huge change in how policies work. And over time, these policies would, I, I don't know exactly when the Supreme Court decided this, but over time, the current system is that you don't even need to prove that there is a racist intent, like you don't need to find letters and memos and emails for a redistricting, redistricting plan. If you can prove that there's a discriminatory outcome of a redistricting plan, then you can bring that to court, and the Supreme Court does not mess around with that. They will review that very seriously and tell you to redraw districts that don't fit their conditions. So there's a real risk now that 2020 might be as big of a shift as the 1960s, and it might not be a very positive shift. So the book that I'm displaying here is, is sort of going around now, and there's this discussion about how people have started to very intentionally think about redistricting in one state or redistricting in all the states in a very intentional way could lead you to have more control over the House of Representatives. And so there are some very intentional cross-state policies that helped create the map that was designed in 2010. And there's some different research going different ways, but it's generally agreed that the Republicans have an advantage in several states, including the Pennsylvania example I showed you earlier, due to some very careful redistricting. And it makes sense that it's possible to do that now because there's more advanced computing, 
Uh, there's big data being collected on individual voters. Uh, even things like the buttons you press on your cable box. That stuff gets sold and connected to your voting record and builds up an idea of like, okay, what is this person's policies? How can we advertise to this person? Something like that. So in 2013, there was a decision uh, taking down Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And you might ask, so what's wrong with a Voting Rights Act that from the 1960s is now being challenged in the Supreme Court? And what went wrong here is that this particular section is really interesting. It says that districts and areas that have done discriminatory voting practices in the past get special scrutiny. So they would ha need to draft their plan for voting or districting and send it to the US Justice Department or a DC district court to get approved just to just if you're on the naughty list basically from a real historical record then you get on this and so there were several districts that were doing this for since the 1960s and uh, when the Supreme Court ruled against it within hours uh, some states were initiating voting ID laws and such that previously they were sort of afraid to send through the Justice Department uh, now, I read one book about this that was sort of saying not to worry about this, and that in recent history, only 0.1% of voting plans have been rejected by the Justice Department. But that's a little bit like saying, oh, there's no uh, problem with um, uh, corruption on Wall Street. Let's get rid of the SEC. We don't need it anymore, right? It's sort of like saying, oh, like it, because only a small number of people are proposals are being rejected, now we can take away the regulator. They're, as soon as they know that regulator is gone, there can be some really major changes made without that kind of oversight and without them wondering what's going to happen with their regulation. So the Supreme Court has been pretty strongly against any sort of gerrymandering and redistricting that disenfranchises minority groups and does racial gerrymandering. But one thing that people are talking about now, which is part of the Red Map Initiative and other things, is whether partisan gerrymandering, gerrymandering to benefit a particular political party, could you do that seriously enough for it to be unconstitutional? And this is sort of an open question. The Supreme Court has ruled that it's a possibility before, but put a lot of conditions in place that in recent years, it hasn't been the case. They haven't been able to prove this case in Supreme Court recently. Um, and so far in the past, it wasn't as big of an issue. Now that there's like a national coordinated effort, now that it's much easier to predict which people are going to vote one way or the other, um, partisan gerrymandering is becoming a much more serious issue. And so the Supreme Court is still very cautious about this. This is part of what they're going to be talking about this year. There's going to be a um, Supreme Court case uh, with Wisconsin uh, being decided this year around partisan gerrymandering issues. And the last time this went to Supreme Court was in 2004. Texas redrew their districts in the middle of the decade because some states you can do that. Like you can say, I don't like what we did after the census. Let's try again and make it a little bit more, tweak it a little bit. Uh, so in 2004, Justice Kennedy looked at this case and said, okay, we, we're, we're not telling you you can't do partisan gerrymandering. We still think partisan gerrymandering is wrong, but how is the Supreme Court supposed to create a standard? Because they don't want to just look at a district and say, that looks funny. They want to have like an objective standard that they can apply and test further on in the judicial process. Um, so I'll read part of the quote. It definitely sounds like a hackathon pitch, I think, when I'm looking at it. It says, technology is both a threat and a promise. Uh, it may produce new methods of analysis that make more evident the precise nature of gerrymanders and the representational rights of voters and parties. If suitable standards do emerge, hindsight would show that the court prematurely abandoned the field. So if you can come up with some standards, we'd like to see them. So since then, and with this kind of hackathon or this kind of gerrymandering summer school project, they've been trying to come up with some different metrics or tools that not only 
are like an objective standard, but can be explained to a judge in a bench trial around redistricting cases. Because that has its own set of problems. If you come up with this very elegant mathematical proof, but you can't explain it in court, then it's never going to get sent back to Justice Kennedy. So you have to kind of like come up with a really good system of proving it and then being able to explain it. So we're going to try to come up with, we're facing this enemy, and we're going to try to use, and the technology is making it easier to gerrymander, so we're going to try to come up with technology that can counter it. So there's a really uh, interesting project. There's an interesting project called B districting, where they're trying to draw the districts entirely by algorithm. So this is run by Brian Olson. Uh, I, he's done this for every state legislature field that you can think of. And this is, so on the left, you'll see uh, his proposal that's come up with a algorithm that focuses on compactness. It's like a geometry problem, trying to fit the same number of people into the most regular district. And the one on the right is the current one that you live in. And um, this is interesting, and he has some really interesting statistics on it. But I really want to say, please stop trying to come up with these computer algorithms that solve gerrymandering. Because, I mean, this is drawn just entirely by computer without thought to individual people and how they're represented in Congress. There is, like, some practice and experience where, like, in Mexico, there is an algorithm that they use to start redistricting. And then if you propose changes, they ha you have to prove that they there's like a formula to show that, the pr that your changes improve the fairness of the districts. But in general, every district has a story. Uh, and this is one that I really hope that makes sense and I get a chance to talk about. Um, so are, have people seen this district before? Familiar with it? Because it is here in Chicago, the Illinois 4th District. And I'm sorry, I did not take a political science course. So like when someone says, this is a gerrymander, I look at this and say, it's a gerrymander. And has anyone seen this map before? A few people. So this is the New York Times has like a population density map, which they've color coded based on the race of the people who are living in that census block. And Chicago is like housing segregated to an extent. Many cities are. Most cities are, I think. Um, and so when I put those two maps on top of each other, you'll see that it's not, it's not just an accidental placement of those borders. There is sort of an intentional plan here and in creating those borders. It's connecting two separate uh, Hispanic communities that otherwise would be sort of merged into another district. And then the district that kind of goes in between those two halves uh, goes further down into the south side and is a black majority district. So this practice is called majority-minority districts. Uh, this is sort of decided by the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s. And then over time, the Supreme Court has defended it and defined it using something that's called the jingles conditions. So they were trying to come up with what is a good way to represent minority groups in Congress. And there are several ways that you could do this. I don't particularly know like the best way or the right way. But in the 1960s, they wanted to come up with a system that would logically follow and create this sort of representation in Congress. And I think for me, what really sells me on this is that uh, if you look at the House and you look at the Senate, the Senate has never had like real diversity in it. Like, there's several reasons for that, like who is being nominated to run. Uh, there's sort of like seniority within the party. There's some different rules like that. But you can definitely look at what happens when there's a statewide election and say, you know what, maybe it makes sense if there's a community of interest. That's the phrase they use. It's not a, it's, the phrase uses a community of interest that needs to, wants to sh have a candidate of their choice, then it, is sort of discriminatory to split up that community into other areas and sort of disenfranchise them. So the Supreme Court has protected this uh, in cases of two or three different minority groups living close together. 
Um, so I think the benefits are clear, and there are some alternatives that have been suggested. One that I heard about at the conference is that if there was a system where each person got five votes, and each person you voted for, you could select one to five votes for them, then there could be like a particular strong interest on one candidate. You could put five votes, for example. And there, theoretically, this would be more supportive, but I don't know of anyone in the United States that sort of moved forward in making a system like this. Even, this is something that I, I really appreciate hearing from political scientists and lawyers at the conference. Even having a city-wide election can disenfranchise people. So uh, I'm from New Hampshire. Uh, this conference was in Massachusetts. So they spoke to people who represented uh, the city of Lowell, or challenged the city of Lowell, I should say. So has anyone been to Lowell? OK, some people, OK. Um, so it's actually one of the more diverse places in Massachusetts. Uh, but because all of the positions for city council were citywide elected, uh, minority groups were not even able to select one candidate, elect one candidate into office without kind of crossing over. And so they were asking, is it possible that you can redistrict this and everyone can be represented a little bit more equally? And in Minneapolis, this has happened on a more successful level. This is uh, 2013. Once there was a community involvement in setting the district boundaries, uh, in one election, you get the first Hmong, Somali, and Hispanic city council members. So this is more happening on the local level, like even like school board and city council decisions. But this is a case where you could say, I want ordinary people to know what's going on with their district and be able to say, I want this district to look like this. Or, I, I mean, I think everyone should have an equal opportunity to run for office and represent their community. And there's sort of like this mathematical thing of saying, how do we quantify that? How do we compensate for like something that we've calculated as like a racist factor, right? So there's sort of building up experience in these different legal cases and across the country to understand what happens if you redistrict in the right way or the wrong way. And there's sort of this complex twist to this where uh, what you see in the middle here, you can see it pretty well, I hope, is that orange district is North Carolina's 12th district. It's not following a river, it's just kind of there. Uh, and this was struck down by the Supreme Court fairly recently as racially motivated gerrymandering. And the defense of people in North Carolina, the state legislature, was that it was a partisan gerrymander and that it was therefore legal. So this is a weird space where you say, well, like, is it possible that they were just trying to find Democrats and not try to exclude a particular racial group? And this is the sort of thing that, you know, you have to go into different legal cases about it. Um, but it's definitely an unusual district. It's the sort of thing where their intent is being weighed and things like that. So it's sort of an ongoing process, and it would be a lot easier if there was a test for partisan gerrymandering that said, well, even if you were doing this to make it impossible for the other districts to vote Democrat, it should be illegal because you're, you're creating a district that's so abnormal. So there's several other ideas. So I mentioned there was this like hackathon pitch. How are we going to do this? So uh, the organizer of this conference, uh, Moon Duchin, is a math professor at Tufts University. And she is proposing to use some different measures of curvature. Uh, there's some other mathematicians there that were doing some graph theory. Uh, I included this diagram because it makes sense to me that you would connect the different districts and nodes. Uh, do we have like mathematician, like really up there mathematician people here? It's OK. You can say you're up there. <laughs> OK, cool. So I have to have one of you math people do that thing where you ask a question, but it's really more of a comment to like. <laughs> You're, you, you were totally excused for that because I really tried to understand what the curvature thing is. But I mean, I, I thought I took geometry at some point. But I mean, they're, they're like this extra level of geometry. Um, there's also this statistic called ecological inference, where I mean, you don't know how every individual person voted. But if you collect demographics about different 
polling places and voting records from those polling places, you could come up with a, like a band of probability about uh, how people are voting and use that to say like whether the district has been gerrymandered in a racial or partisan way. Maybe we could use supercomputers. Uh, these two people I met and uh, Wendy Cho spoke at the conference. There's a video on YouTube uh, where they're using supercomputers to look at the district map. And it's not possible to create all of the possible districts. But what they do is they create many millions of districts and maps. And there are different approaches. Their approach, as I understand it, is they come up with an algorithm that's random and unbiased and follows the laws and regulations for creating districts. And then they have a second algorithm that has a partisan bias. And the idea is if you made like a normal distribution of computer maps, where would you find the real world map? So think about it. If you create a bunch of random maps, uh, they should kind of follow that like the average would be the most fair. And what usually happens on these graphs is you see like a very normal curve and then the state's plan is like many standard deviations out someplace else. So it's really powerful to say like this map clearly was not just drawn by accident. Because that is a very common claim by researchers is that because of these majority minority districts or because uh, Democrats tend to concentrate in cities, they're saying maybe Democrats just live in the wrong places and we accidentally put them into a gerrymandered district. So it's an interesting argument and if a computer does the same thing, you could say so. But if a computer has a more fair selection, then it seems more intentional. Uh, and whatever we do with this, like in math, in the courts, all things like that, we need to have informed voters. I think that makes the most sense. It's something that all of us can do. And uh, so there were these different groups within the conference. The group that I was working with was sort of the GIS mapping group. And so the projects that were created, um, one is sort of a web app that I'll talk about in a moment. There's another project that's like a Python library that does different uh, curvature metrics. Maybe your mathematician representative can tell us what Polsby Popper, Schwartzberg. I know what convex hull is, but I mean, and REOC, what those ones are. Um, so there's some, several repos up there on GitHub, and there's also like a QGIS plugin that uses this Python script. And sort of, they, they, we've been building up these different tools. Just in the last two days of the conference, they were, we were starting to set this up. And it's gerrymander with no E at the end. It's just gerrymand R like that. Um, so the project that I worked on for those two days, uh, I'm calling District Genius. Do we have any Rap Genius fans? A few people? Let me tell you, when I go into this room of mathematicians and tell them it's going to be like Rap Genius, it did not go over very well. Um, <laughs> But uh, the main idea behind Rap Genius is that you have the lyrics, and then it, you just, as you browse uh, the lyrics, you're getting like crowdsourced annotations and comments that sort of explain what you're looking at. And uh, what I want to do, so if you see that screenshot on the left, is really interesting things like this in my district border. It could be there on purpose, it could be like a school or a park. Or it could just be really weird, and I'm saying, what is this? And things like that, I shouldn't just be able to say, oh, like my district looks really weird. It must be gerrymandered. I would like to have this project kind of grow so that there's sort of some smart people who can come in and tell me what's going on in my district. Why were these borders selected? Are these borders hurting me or helping me in some way? And I'm hoping that we can have that kind of like Rap Genius interface. If you're not on Rap Genius, someone else suggested it should be like uh, SoundCloud, where you know there's like a really interesting point in the soundtrack if there's a bunch of like comments clustered around there, which I've tried to show here. So I don't have that visualization like in place, but I just have like the basic mapping in place. So there's a quote that I came across once that really stuck with me, which is the battle for our tomorrow starts today. And the census is in 2020, so the redistricting is not 
like going to happen like in the immediate future. But this conference is really bringing in a lot of new information, connecting a lot of different people, and trying to come up with a strategy for, I mean, it's run by a nonpartisan group, which is saying that we should be able to come up with standards that objectively tell you if this district is strange or not, if this district is partisan or not. And the theory is that that will make a real difference. It'll make it possible for Congress to more accurately represent what people believe. Uh, so even though it turns out that this quote, when I Googled it, actually I picked it up from the Terminator TV series, um, I think it applies to our democracy as well. Because, <laughs> what we, because you can start planning. We know this is going to happen. We know what's happened before. And the things that we don't like about redistricting in the past, we kind of totally saw and didn't do anything about. Political scientists used to believe that it wasn't that relevant, that it was just used to protect people's districts like it had been back in 1812. But we've seen that there's now a national coordinated effort, sometimes by people from both parties, to change how, what this even means to have a legislature. And I think that if you get involved in this project and read more about it, you can really make a real difference. And so as a reminder, uh, this group is meeting in October in Wisconsin. Uh, there's separate tracks for the math people, uh, educators, expert witnesses, and mapping GIS people. Uh, if uh, you're going, ask a friend if they need help getting there. It's kind of a bit of a ways over to Wisconsin. Uh, I don't really know people personally who are there, but I can help you get in touch with people or help you find the link to register. The registration is already open. You can do some research into it. Um, and that's what I have for right now. Thanks. Um, are there any math majors who want to do the um, comment as a question thing? Please. Speak now or forever hold your calculators? This will be like legendary, you'll be able to tell of your math people. They say, we need a mathematician. <laughs> Is there a mathematician in the room? You know? Can you like riff on it a little bit? <laughs> Is the map that I showed related to it or no? All right, so well, there's one, one of the plots you showed earlier was about like the average connectedness of the center of a district versus the people who live in the district. So that's really important of, you know, you should have a, a district that actually is close to people in the extremities. You know, if, you, if you're some really, really stretched out, windy district, that might not make sense unless there's some really natural feature there. But you tend to want to have connectivity, and I don't know what those nodes are over there exactly, but um, you know, other than natural curvature features, you want to have some sort of like community, probably. You know, it's whatever metric you want to use. Is community important, proximity, whatever. So it, it kind of depends on the metric and how you choose what's right or fair, I guess, which is hard. <laughs> no, yeah, thanks for, thanks for talking about that. I mean, there's a, lot, a bunch of different metrics that you can look into more detail. They are specifically being chosen not to be too complex because they do need to be explained in a courtroom setting at some point if they're being used to challenge districts. Uh, it's just something where, with no prior experience, it was just sort of thinking, like, I didn't know where to really start with that. but. Now we have like, are we going to, are we going to like real questions? We're going to go to real questions. Okay, we're uh, going to go first to real questions. First, a round of applause for Mark for being such a good sport. Yes. I actually had a math explanation. I can't explain the poles by popper one. It, it's, it's just a measure of compactness that like if you have a circle, the ratio of the service area to the, um, to the, the, perimeter of the circle is one, but if you have some other shape, it will be uh, less than one. And so poles by popper is just measuring that. So how close it is to a circle? Yeah. yeah, yeah. but like, so if you string something out really far, it's going to be really low because you have a really large um, perimeter, but same volume. Mm -hmm. uh, questions? So I've been hearing some people talk about the um, 
governor races and how this will affect redistricting. And I was just kind of curious if you had any comments about that and what role the specifically the elections and governor elections play in this. So one of the other people who was at the conference in the GIS track is from a group called Flippable. Uh, they're focusing more on the state legislature of this. But really, if you think about it, a gerrymandering plan gets filed in two separate state houses, unless you're in Nebraska, which only has, anyway, but in most cases, it has the two houses and then it goes to the governor. So if one of those houses or the governor is from a different party, they would speak up if they don't like the plan. So that sort of makes it a little bit more accurate or a little bit more fair. So definitely if you could, if this is a close governor's race, if it's a close uh, group of people that might flip in the state legislature, then that's something that people are interested in. I read about a metric uh, that relates to wasted votes uh, related to kind of cracking and packing. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so kind of the, when you see like a, let me switch over to the partisan one for this. It's a long time ago. Okay, so when you see something like this, they're usually talking about packing and cracking. So packing is a district sort of like um, the one on the right here where you put all the Democrats together, or they're blue, so we're gonna say all the Democrats together in one district or two districts. And cracking is when you split the Democrats up so that they have a minority in multiple districts. Um, so uh, what's going on with this wasted votes or kind of they don't want to go to court and say the vote was wasted, so they sometimes call it an efficiency gap, is saying every vote above 50% was like excess. And every vote of the losing candidate is considered like, you know, failed votes. And so if you look at that metric, you'll see sort of the same thing that, like for example, in Pennsylvania, way back at the beginning, that a number of these districts were very close and the Democrat percentage was kind of wasted. And then in like the major cities where there's a higher concentration of Democrats, they were well above 50%. In Pennsylvania though, there are districts, both for Republicans and Democrats, where they were running unchallenged even. So it's sort of, uh, it's multiple, what did I, what did I say, multi-complicated. Um, so you can measure that, but they're sort of predicting not that we would have proportional representation, but hyper-proportional. If you're saying a vote above 50% is wasted and a vote lost, what you're really calculating is saying at 50%, it should be evenly split. If you have 55% of the vote, you should have 60% of the candidates. At 60% of the vote, you should have 70% of the candidates. Like they're building this sort of curve with that metric, which is just kind of invented. So it's not necessarily the ideal or like a historical precedent. It's more like trying to come up with a number just based on the vote totals, if that makes sense. Um, what, what's the general correlation between like uh, census, you know, districts and congressional? or legislative districts, and is there initiatives that are kind of running in parallel between census sort of process and this initiative? So yeah, the census is a big part of this. The census blocks, is the smallest unit, blocks to block groups, block groups to tracts, tracts to, it just kind of builds up like that. Um, so usually they try to preserve like things that make sense, like even like whole towns, they try to preserve on one side of the district border or another. Um, but when it comes down to, you have to make the districts within like less than 1% of the same population of each other. So if you have kind of an uneven population, then you'll say, okay, let's start shaving off blocks from this district and give them to that one. And so those are how the borders can get really fuzzy, how they're defined. Um, but they do really try to follow like the town borders as much as possible if they can. Uh, but yeah, I think that you're not really supposed to break up like a census block because then how will you know how many people live in it, right? That's the smallest unit of control that they can negotiate back and forth. I'm curious if there, if there it has or is currently this problem anywhere else in the world and if there's any lessons you can learn from what's done elsewhere. So my understanding is that 
it happens, but to a lesser extent. So if you are in the UK, you have the proportional representation, so it's no problem. Uh, I mean, there are regional differences, but um, so there are other countries that have this problem. Like I mentioned in Mexico, they have that algorithm that starts the process. Um, but they don't have the same legal restrictions that we do. And they might not have the same political backgrounds that we do. So really, we can't just sort of, I, I was going to say something earlier about uh, use a redistricting algorithm and make Mexico pay for it. Um, <laughs> Because they have developed it already for us, you know. Um, but um, it, we can't so easily apply it here. Basically, if you did an algorithmic redistricting here, you would be taken to the Supreme Court and lose because you're going to have consequences. You're going to take people out of office and say, well, a computer said that the smallest, most circular district was here. And we can't really propose that just for the sake of geometry. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know how we fix that. I think making there be more awareness or some of these mathematical proposals could be like a, I want to say like a watchdog that prevents someone from just inventing whatever they want. You know? I think we have time for one more question. Oh, wow. I wanted to ask, there was a, a non-technical article in April in the Washington Post that was talking about gerrymandering and just kind of like migration of populace, and I was wondering if you could kind of comment on how both of these things are occurring at the same time, and when I think a lot of us probably in this room here gerrymandering, we think like rigging elections for partisan goals, um, and just kind of how like I grew up in a really rural county, and I live in a really metro area, and I vote differently than my extended family, but it's not because of any redistricting. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they sort of have to make the plan based on like historical boundaries and sort of negotiations. It depends what state you're in also, because uh, like sometimes there'll be a bipartisan committee but then they'll agree to work to protect the incumbent legislators, right? Because Democrats and Republicans can agree, we want to meet up again tomorrow in our same districts. So they'll make that kind of agreement, even if there's a bipartisan committee. Um, I mean, in terms of migration, it is kind of interesting to think about, like every 10 years, they, we do the census. And so in that 10 years, I mean, are all of us in the same place that we lived 10 years ago? I mean, are the numbers of people in cities changing and the population distribution changing? And that's like five different elections that happen in that gap. So even if they redistrict in the middle of the year, they're going back to the census numbers from the beginning of the decade. Um, so there isn't really that kind of direct response to migration. It's more like once the census happens, we'll know a little bit more about what's changed. And by the way, make sure that you fill out the census for yourself and make sure people around you fill out the census. Uh, there's some like conspiracy theories about I'm going to be harmed by filling out the census. But if you don't do it, then you're not counted and your state could lose representation or your area could be moved from one area to another without really being really counted in this system. So it's the people who are counted by the census who help control where the line is drawn, if that makes sense. Okay, so you said we're, we're done with questions, so I'll, I'll gladly accept more questions afterward, but yeah, I should like hand this over so we can split up into the different groups if you do.